So why did Lamb choose a character for his essay writing? Why did he simply not sign his famous London essays running from 1820 to around 1825? Why did he not simply sign these Charles Lamb? Why did he come up with the nickname, the persona, the alter ego, Elia? Well, in a letter he said that he initially chose the name because his first essay for London Magazine called South Sea House uh, was about uh, a business firm where his brother worked and he thought that it might embarrass his brother John if he were to sign his name to an essay that was somewhat satirically oriented toward the South Sea House. He said that he borrowed the name from a former employee of the South Sea House, um, an Italian man who was also a writer himself, and his name was Elia. Well, all this is probably true, but in the end, the name Elia has many more meanings than the ones that I just described. Let's think about it. Uh, the, the name itself, uh, however you pronounce it, it has lots of um, opportunities for punning. Elia, um, what does that sound like? It sounds a little bit like a liar. And if we transposition, transpose the letters a little bit, we can easily see the word as spelling a lie. So that's the first meaning, the idea that Lamb is writing in a persona that might well be a liar, that is not to be trusted. Well, what does this do to our sense of the authority of the essay writer? Well, it's problematic. What about this? Um, Elia suggests Elijah um, from the Bible, who is, of course, a prophet of the Bible. And as a prophet, Elijah would have been a voice of God and therefore would have profound authority and would be a speaker of the truth. So right there, Elia means both liar and truth teller at the same time. This is an irony, a self-canceling utterance that Lamb, the great lover of irony, would have loved. Well, let's think of the word in other ways. Um, what if you pronounce it Elia? Elia. And Lamb at certain points su suggested that it should be pronounced Elia. Well, then you hear the L, L, um, which emphasizes, of course, the idea that a lamb, L, writes it. Um, furthermore, um, we can hear slightly in the word Elia, the word elegy. And one recent critic has said that Lamb probably intended this because, of course, his essays are so elegiac. Uh, they are constantly uh, lamenting what is passing, what is lost, and they all have a slightly melancholy tone in spite of their, their comic verb. So let's go further into this. Aside from the meanings of the actual name, um, why would Lamb choose a persona in the first place? A Lamb in an essay, um, where he explores Hazlitt's own essay writing, says that he believes that the best essay writers create an eye that functions like a character in a novel. He goes back and looks at some of the famous 18th century um, essayists, um, in particular the essayists who wrote for The Spectator. And he says that The Spectator, as is presented in The Spectator essays, is no better than a, a writer of aphorism. In other words, there's no reigning personality there. There's no sense that from essay to essay there is a unique, indeed an eccentric voice uh, gathering the different observations from the different essays. In contrast, someone like uh, Samuel Johnson in The Rambler uh, creates in The Rambler a more unified persona uh, who functions like a character in a novel. This, Lamb says, gives the essays uh, the kind of tension or friction that we would gain from reading a first-person novel uh, where we know the past of the I and therefore we have certain expectations of this I and the expectations can be fulfilled, they can be undercut, they can be questioned. In other words, a drama emerges from the essays if they are dominated by one particular uh, persona. Now, of course, the, the progenitor of this um, idea of the essay uh, having a unifying personality is Montaigne himself, the originator of the essay, the French essayist Montaigne. Um, his essays, essay, um, is French for attempt, experiment, try. And this is very important because the essay as a genre is ultimately a mode of exploration. 
And this is why often the, the, the familiar essay, the familiar essay as opposed to a more standard analytical essay or expository essay, the familiar essay is often hesitant, um, riddled with doubt. Uh, it is often experimental in form. And furthermore, the familiar essay generally focuses on everyday events that we can all identify with. And the eye of the familiar essay tends to be conversational, f f familiar, uh, someone that you might recognize, someone whose talk, whose chit chat, whose table talk you want to follow, that you simply want to listen to. So voice is very important in the familiar essay as well. Not only attitude, disposition, uh, cynicism, doubt, but also voice. Um, you want to hear this person talk. But also, and this is a third part of the familiar essay as it began with Montaigne and developed up through someone like Lamb, is that it does tend to be elegiac. It does tend to be melancholy. Why? Because the essayist tends to focus on the passing things of everyday life. And these things give him joy, but yet they are transient and they will go away. So rarely is the personal essay, the familiar essay, the Lamian essay affirmative at the end. Um, but it is funny, and this is a, a fourth part. Um, we're talking about disposition, um, cynical. We're talking about voice, must be unique. We're talking about melancholy, elegiac sense of the familiar essay. And finally, I would mention that the familiar essay tends to be comical. Why? Because it tends to set up this, this gap between expectation and reality, which is, of course, the, the space where almost all comedy takes place. I mean, the most basic moment in comedy is the man slipping on a banana peel. Peel. He expects to walk upright, but the reality is he falls on his butt. So the, the essayist, um, who is sort of aware of how the world really works, he tends not to be an idealist. Uh, he tends not to be a sentimentalist, though Lamb certainly had his sentimental side. He tends to be someone who is somewhat realistic about how life really is. And this, of course, is ultimately the comic mode. Um, we expect life to be beautiful. It's not. We expect um, to gain certainty in life. We do not. We accept permanence, we don't get it. And if we look at this not through a bitter eye, but through a kind of generous eye, um, we can ultimately laugh at how silly it is for us to go through the world expecting it to reach our expectations when in fact it won't. Um, that's hilarious seen from a certain point of view, um, how silly it is. Uh, and that's ultimately what you get with Lamb. Uh, even though there is melancholy there, there is ultimately a sense of affirmation, um, the grand comic vision that if we choose to look at things comically, the world will ultimately be more pleasurable than painful.